One of the things he says, is it still relevant? Do you agree? Should we move on? Should we return? I'm a confirmed pragmatist, and to me, this is the really pragmatic of these sessions. It's the question of what do we do with all of these things that Kaplan talked about? How do we translate it into our practice? How do we translate it into, uh, into religious practice, liturgy? How do we translate it into our everyday practices? And that's, uh, to me, the, uh, a relevant question and, and, and the core of what I've been trying to get at. And so I'd like the discussion session to maybe, if you have those kinds of thoughts and questions, to focus on how do we translate this into action? How do we translate this into what we do? I'm going to start out talking about Judaism as the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people, and then uh, talk about the function and place of re religion, and you can read that. So Kaplan's view of Judaism is that it is the vol evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. So let's look at each of those words. Judaism is not and has never been, says Kaplan, a static religion. It's always evolved. And Kaplan asks not whether it will evolve, but can we evolve it in a way that will make it meet the needs of, the, of Jews in North America, of Jews who are uh, full citizens for the first time of, of the civilization in which they're living. So that's evolving. It's always evolved. We need to evolve it deliberately rather than let it evolve organically. It has to be religious. We can no more separate religion from civilization than we can separate whiteness from snow. Religion is an inherent, integral part of the civilization. And it's an integral, inherent part of, of Judaism. By reflecting the most important group interests by means of rites and symbols, a religion fortifies the collective consciousness. Religious consciousness is thus the intimate phase of group consciousness. OK, so what does that mean? It means that, that the religion creates rites and symbols which will reinforce the consciousness of the group, that it's the civilization that relies on the religion and the religion that lies on the civilization, but not on the nature of God, but how the concept of God affects human behavior. So here's the civilization part. The civilization is defined by its attributes. And an organic ensemble of a common tradition, a common language and literature, history, laws, customs, and folkways, with religion as the integrating and soul-giving factor of these elements. The future of American Judaism. Now, in most, many of these quotes, I give the source. So therefore, Judaism is the, in, the religion that integrates the Jewish people. So we sometimes when we talk about Jewish civilization, some people do think about kind of folkways. He talks about this. Does he not? Folkways. What are Jewish folkways? Well, you know, bagels and basketball, people might say. But that's not all, that's part of Judaism. It's part of the religion, of the civilization. But that's not the religion. It has to be inherently uh, religious. And, and it's the common, he talks about it, a common tradition, a common language. What's the common language? The common language is Hebrew. What's the common literature? The common literature is Torah, and Torah and Kaplan's broad meaning, and I'm sorry, Sid, I forgot. Um, I, Sid suggested that we should start this with uh, the bracha for studying Torah, because in Kaplan's broad definition of Torah, what we're doing is certainly studying Torah of the Jewish people, evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. That gets us to the function and place of religion. Jewish religion is part of the civilization, but it is not all of Judaism. And this is Kaplan essentially saying, people think that ethical idealism or religion is synonymous with Judaism, but they are only part 
They mean nothing, says Kaplan, apart from the particular civilization through which they find expression. So let's look at the aspects of religion, and that's essentially an outline of where um, really the, most of the rest of this discussion goes, to talk about the aspects of the Jewish religion. Salvation is a very important concept in, in Kaplanian Judaism. And we have touched on it, earlier sessions have touched on it as well. They've talked about both personal and communal salvation. And Kaplan is very clear about personal and communal salvation, that you can't have personal salvation without a community. And the community can't have salvation unless its members can achieve personal salvation. And in a way, I think, the choice of the word salvation is unfortunate because when, when we think of salvation, uh, you think of kind of the Salvation Army, right? You think of the Christian idea of salvation, which is that of being saved through the agency, uh, through a supernatural agency. Jude, Kaplan doesn't mean anything of this sort. Kaplan means, as I say here, human fulfillment. And, and we have had quotes uh, and, and some discussion about that in, in earlier sessions. But the, the salvation of the Jewish people is, is not this commitment to a faith, but rather a commitment to universal human values, to human fulfillment. And, and not from any uh, legal description. You don't achieve salvation, according to Kaplan, by observing all the mitzvot. You achieve salvation when when all of your um, effort is aimed at higher values. What are the higher values? At human values, justice and respect for others, at, at tzedakah, at all of those kinds of, of impulses for good that, that accompany the Jewish religion. Let's look at this last quote here. This is uh, Kaplan. Our salvation as Jews depends on our having the moral courage to effect a return to the three historic ideals of Judaism. Jewish peoplehood, which we've talked about. Jewish homeland. Remember, this was, I think this one was written, Sid, do you remember? This is well before uh, the establishment of the State of Israel. Jewish homeland and Jewish religion. And when he talks about religion here, again, he's talking about the the, his concept of religion, which is that it is aiming for salvation. So here's personal salvation. Yeah. Just go back to one slide. It's just going to be a clarification question. Reimagining the historic ideals of Judaism. Could you kind of clarify that? The same language is used in the quotation that, uh, that these three elements are the three historic ideals of Judaism. Are those the three reimagined historic ideals? Uh, yes, that those three historic ideals need to be reimagined, that the, especially that the religion needs to be reimagined, reinvigorated, restructured, reconstructed, if you will. That it's the religion that needs to be reimagined. And, and I, I think also the concept of Jewish peoplehood, as, as we heard Sid uh, say in the last session, Kaplan talked a lot about, about ethical nationhood which isn't necessarily the traditional concept of Jewish peoplehood. And so he's thinking that each of these, he's saying, let's go back to those, the moral courage to effect a return, but that they need to be reimagined in making that return. Here's a good definition, I think, uh, one of the most succinct I've seen of what Kaplan means by uh, personal salvation. When our mind functions in such a way that we feel that all our powers are actively employed in the achievement of desirable ends, we have achieved personal salvation. So Kaplan is really talking about uh, a, very, a, a very uplifting idea, an idea that that, and, and, and God is, the, we'll see, God is the power that makes for salvation. It is God that can move us towards that state of, of hum, being of humanity. And then 
again, self-fulfillment is empty unless it occurs within and contributes to a community. And this is a long quotation, so I'll let you read it rather than me, but I think it's a, it, 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 well, it ends with a well-known, if I am but for myself, what am I? Um, and it, this is from the meaning of God in modern Jewish religion, as is the first quote there. The goal of the religion and of being is salvation, personal and communal salvation. How does the religion organize itself? A religion organizes itself through sancta. Kaplan talks about a religion having sancta, about Judaism having sancta, and he says in this quote, the religion which invests with universal import the sancta of the civilization in which it functions has the most survival value. A religion does so when it enables these sancta to elicit loyalty not merely to one's people, but also loyalty to that which is regarded as the deepest and holiest of human interests. And what is he saying here? He's saying that, and we'll get to some, I, I think, more concrete examples. He's saying that if what a people or a religion hold as sancta are particularistic, are aimed only at the promotion of that religion or that people, that this does not have long-term survival value. That what has long-term survival value is attaching to the sancta of your religion the humanistic values, the values that are essentially the values that make for salvation, the values that we talked about as the values of, of salvation. Judaism, Kaplan said, has survived because its sancta have become uh, universal, and as we reevaluate the tradition, we need to ensure that the Jewish sancta remain universal, that we attach universal uh, importance to our sancta. Kaplan lists, and this is what you would expect as a list of sancta, it, it takes a while to find a specific list. This is from uh, questions Jews ask. The, the sancta are the Sabbath, the holy days, the Torah, the prophets, the holy writings, the synagogue, the Hebrew language, and Eretz Yisrael. And he might well go on beyond that. But the point is, here, Kaplan is defining the sancta fairly broadly. Would we call, could we call Moses as one of the sancta, as the hero? Kaplan would probably define that way, that way yes. And equally important, are Judaism's human values held as sancta, and tzedakah, community, and, and the importance of study, the importance of tzedakah, the importance of community. But none of these lists has 613 mitzvot, vote, as what Kaplan would see as a sanctum of the Jewish people. None of these lists has halakha, as what Kaplan would see as one of the sancta of the Jewish people. Because, I think, that he would say that most, many of these are particularistic rather than universal, that it's very hard to endow the rules about sacrifice or the rules of the red heifer as with universality. And so we don't see those as sancta. But, says Kaplan, these are an important part of our Jewish heritage. We don't ignore all of the 613 meets vote. We need to, to look at and reinterpret, not necessarily all 613, but to look at them. And that's what's coming up next, is to talk about first Torah and then functional analysis. Kaplan talks about Torah very broadly, a very broad definition of Torah. The received text, the oral text, the Pentateuch, the Tanakh, the Talmud, or the received text, and the oral tradition. And all of that which goes with it as the essence of Torah, as the essence of Jewish culture. And, and here, this, is, this isn't strictly speaking a quote. Um, this, is, this is a paraphrase, in effect, of, of what Kaplan said about Torah in, in this article in the National Jewish Monthly in 1940, 
but the name that he says Torah, the Jews' primary and lifelong concern. What does he mean by Torah here? He doesn't mean that the Jews' primary and lifelong concern should be the study of the five books of Moses, the study of that text, and the study only of commentaries on that text, but rather the Torah much more broadly defined, much more broadly defined. As, as Sid, Sid and I, I'm, Sid suggested that we should start with the blessing for studying Torah because in Kaplan's definition, this is studying Torah. This is part of that very broad definition of what we see as the sancta of the Jewish people and our need to study it. And I, I, to mean, Kaplan used Torah to mean the heritage of the Jewish people about which he urges Jews to learn as a lifelong commitment to study both for themselves and so they can pass it to their children. That's crucial for, for Kaplan. Again, here's a further elucidation of that point in, in this quote. I don't think we need to unpack it. Just for the modern Jew, the study of Torah or its equivalent, Jewish culture and education, its equivalent, Jewish culture and education, has to embrace whatever knowledge would enable us Jews to retain our individuality as a people, discern our true identity, and know the meanings and methods of achieving it. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about Torah. When we look at the religion, we say, what do we need to do to reinvigorate Judaism? We've talked about that the religion itself must be reinvigorated because it meet, needs to meet the needs of Jews uh, in North America. But it needs to follow these themes that we've talked about, the evolving religious civilization, salvation, which is the goal of the religion, respecting the sancta of Judaism, therefore including the study of Torah, meaning, as we just said, education in Jewish culture and history. In order to meet these criteria, we need a thorough rethink of the Jewish religion. The first step is the functional analysis. What did this practice, what did this law, what did this usage provide, what function did it serve at the time that it arose? What function did it serve that made it survive? Is there a need to meet that function? Does that function still need to be met? If so, can we adapt, can we simply use the traditional practice as it stands? If we can't, can we adapt the traditional practice, either by rethinking it, or by reimagining it, or by rewording it, or whatever? And if we can't do that, those are the first things we want to do. We want to keep the traditional practice, if it has a function, and if it can be adapted, and if it can be used. If not, we need to adapt it. If not, we need to find something else that will meet that function. And We'll, we'll see when we talk about what, ha what he does with texts uh, that, that he is, that, that in addition to uh, finding, looking, when he looks at, these, at this functional analysis, when he says, can it be adapted? Can it be uh, turned around again? One of the questions is, do we have an ethical problem with this practice? or with this wording or with this prayer. And if we have an ethical problem, then it can't be used in its form and we need to adapt it. So how do we do that? If the tradition is abandoned, that, this is what I just said. Now, we've, I've, we've said that Kaplan is very wordy and not pithy, but I found a bunch of pithy things. So there you go. A religion without ritual is like a suit of clothes without buttons. It won't stay closed. It won't hang together. We're to thinking about reinvigorating Judaism. Does it need a new denomination? Should Reconstructionism be a denomination? Kaplan said no. Kaplan was already concerned about, about schisms, about denominational splits. And he wanted reform and, re and conservative movements to adopt uh, Reconstructionist ideas without having to start a new uh, denomination. And here's his Reconstructionism five-point program, again, from questions Jews ask. So here's the five-point program. Upbuilding Eretz Yisrael, 
fostering Jewish learning and culture. We've talked about these two things. Effort to understand the meaning of God in terms of human experience. Establishment of organic communities and allying ourselves with all social forces that make for freedom, justice, and peace. A five-point program. This is what Kaplan says Reconstructionism uh, should advocate and do, and he nowhere in here does it say anything about setting up rabbinical colleges, uh, becoming a movement. He would like this five-point program to be adopted by everyone. And, and this is, the purpose is that of achieving Jewish unity despite diversity of belief and practice. So Kaplan wanted Judaism to be a broad tent, of course, and Reconstructionism to be a force that would, that would bring together these five points among all the movements and become a unifying force among the movements. However, Ira Eisenstein and others felt that you had to become a movement and uh, the congregational organization, uh, Furch, the predecessor of JRF, which is now defunct or about to become defunct, was founded in 54, Reconstruction's Rabbinical College opened in 68, and that made it a movement. So now it is a denomination. What did Reconstructionism have as a movement? It actually started out not too bad. The prayer books had been published in the first, the Haggadah in 1941, the Siddur in 1945, the Machzor in 1948. It had an organization of member congregations, it had its publication, The Reconstructionist, and it had other literature. So it was not too badly set up as a movement. What it didn't have, of course, is a theology. Because Kaplan kind of didn't believe in theology or dogma, and so Reconstructionism didn't have any. So let's look at Reconstructionist practice. So when Kaplan talked about uh, reinvigorating the religion, he wanted to review the religious practice. And, and I really kind of already talked about this, that the review was to use the functional analysis to classify the tradition into one of these three categories, the famous, the past should have a vote, not a veto, and uh, the, the reconstructionist practice should be uh, reinterpreted in that way. How about prayer? What are the essential functions of prayer? Connecting with God, with the power that makes for salvation, the power that makes for human fulfillment. So the purpose of the prayer, one purpose of prayer, is to connect with God. Another purpose is to connect with the community. So prayer is all about salvation, is all about connecting with God, is the power that makes for salvation, is all about connecting with the community. If God is the process that makes for creativity, integration, love, and justice, the function of prayer is to render us conscious of that process. Not to connect with any idea of a supernatural divine, but rather to render us conscious of the process that makes for uh, salvation, for creativity, integration, love, and justice, another way of saying what Kaplan means by salvation. And prayer can also be used for personal reflection and meditation, but it is not intended to petition the deity for any supernatural intervention because we don't believe in supernatural intervention. So uh, the, obviously, what, when we praise God in the liturgy, we're not intending to, uh, to propitiate God so that the rain will fall or whatever, but, but rather to connect um, with that process that makes for salvation. <laughs> this one, I said Kaplan can be pithy, and I just thought this was too good not to put in. I couldn't figure out exactly where, but. <laughs> so if we want to know what Kaplan thought about the second day of Rosh Hashanah, <laughs> there you go. That talked about adapting religion. What about adapting content? The first publication, the first liturgical publication, was the New Haggadah in 1941. Uh, and that was, in a lot of ways, a revolutionary Haggadah. And you can now go into Israel's and, and get, find at least a, a couple of dozen, I would guess, at least a dozen, probably a couple of dozen, more, 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 different Haggadahs. But 
in, in 1941, there wasn't that kind of proliferation of texts. I mean, there was different decorations, but there wasn't that proliferation of approaches. And Kaplan uh, stated in the foreword to this Haggadah, and, and this is long, but I do want to read much of it, could go through it, because Kaplan, in this foreword, Kaplan lays out how he intends to reinterpret liturgy, to reinterpret the prayers, to adapt them. He says, this Haggadah is new. We have retained the traditional framework with its archaic charm, oh thanks, um, but we have filled it in with a living, compelling context of present day idealism and aspiration. We have prepared a text which enunciates the essential message of Pesach clearly and unmistakably. And it does do that. I, I have a whole lot of copies of the old uh, Reconstruction of Sagata because I used it. And Sid borrowed them this year to, for his Seder because he said, it tells the story in a very straightforward way. If you ever look at that old Haggadah, it tells the story in a very straightforward way, actually much more straightforward than the new Reconstruction of Sagata. This is, this is where he really talks about how he's going to approach change. Among the innovations in this Haggadah are the omission of those exegetical passages contained in the traditional Haggadah that convey no special message and the inclusion of entirely new readings. Those pages, however, which lend themselves to symbolic interpretation, such as those which speak of the Messiah or Elijah, have been retained. All references to events, real or imagined, in the Exodus story, which might conflict with our own highest ethical standards, have been omitted. The second part, oh, that's enough. All, I, this is key. References to events which might conflict with our own highest ethical standards have been omitted. For example, the plagues were omitted in, the first, in that first Haggadah. I, yeah, it was put back in a 1978 edition because people screamed. But, but the, the plagues were omitted. The enunciation of the plagues was omitted in the first uh, reconstruction of Haggadah. The other, another important innovation in this Haggadah is to change the story. The, the new Haggadah tells the story of the Exodus. It tells the story of the burnt, it tells the story of Moses from the burning bush to the crossing of the Red Sea. The traditional Haggadah, pick up a traditional Haggadah, Maxwell House Haggadah is the one I have several copies of, I happen to have, and you won't find Moses mentioned at all, not once. Because the traditional Haggadah wants this to be a story of divine agency, not human agency, divine agency. And Kaplan wanted it to be a story of human agency. And so he tells the story of Moses. I think he actually tells the story from the finding of Moses in the, in the basket, uh, right through. So this Haggadah, that is, a, as I said, a revolutionary approach. Another approach that was revolutionary was to make the Pesach story universal. If Pesach is one of the sancta, it has to be universal. What is its universal message? Its universal message is a message of freedom. And it would not been seen, in general, as a universal message of freedom, traditionally. So this Haggadah made that change. What else did it do? It took out the idea of chosenness. Louise said it talks about the outstretched arm. How do we know that there were you know, 50 things and it was because the outstretched arm had five fingers and you had on each, there were five things for 10 things for each finger or something like that. And, and that's what he means by the exegetical passages. That's all gone from the, from the first Reconstruction of Haggadah, from the 1941. It was called the New Haggadah, and it was new. Then in 1945, he publishes the Siddur, and he pulls a lot together, a lot of, of what he had been thinking about, about Reconstructionist practice, into that Siddur. And, 
and people said, you know, Kaplan at the time was teaching at the Jewish Theological Seminary, as he continued to do. And they said, you know, how, how can this guy be teaching the Jewish Theological Seminary? He's taking out the concept of chosenness, et cetera. And the Union of Orthodox Rabbis burned the Siddur publicly. And they also put Kaplan under a harem. In the introduction to the second edition of the Siddur, there are four principles. And much of this is, is direct quotes. The Siddur must be reverential of the traditional worship text because only so can the experience of worship strengthen in the Jew his sense of communion with the Jewish past and with the universal Israel in the present. So it has to be reverential, respectful of the traditional text. But it, it should draw from broader Jewish sources in the traditional text. It must take clear cognizance of the problems and aspirations of mankind and Jewry today. This will require, he said, this introduction said, recreating new prayers, and it must have the courage to set aside or modify such prayers or phrases as are unacceptable to modern man, whether intellectually, morally, or aesthetically. Otherwise, integrity in worship becomes impossible. So he had to be uh, at a point where he could believe what he was saying in the prayer, where he could accept what he was saying in the prayer, whether more metaphorically or literally. If there was something there that he couldn't live with, he took it out. That introduction also then listed the major departures. Anything that asserts the superiority of the Jews, the chosenness, the modification of Elenu, for example, that all had to be modified, either taken out completely or modified. So in, instead of Asher Bachar Bano Mikol Ho Amim, who has called us from among all your people, we say Asher Kirvano Lavo Dato. We still say that in our Torah blessing. It's kind of one of the most obvious things when visitors come that they don't know that part of that difference in the prayer. And it's part of this first thing, asserting the superiority of Jews recognizing the human authorship of the Bible and that biblical miracles are not historical events. Earnest prayer for Israel's restoration and the coming of God's kingdom, but not for the coming of the Messiah. That continues. These are, again, uh, modifications that Kaplan, that it says in that foreword, are made to that Siddur. Takes up all the references to the restoration of the priesthood and the sacrificial system. Actually, that first Sidur does have a Musaf, which the new Reconstructionist, which Kol Hanashamar, which is the book we use, doesn't. But it, doesn't, it isn't a Musaf that, that is an attempt to reenact the sacrificial rite, which is what a traditional Musaf does. Kaplan, Eisenstein, and Kohn did most of this, um, of this revision. Eisenstein, Ira Eisenstein, Rabbi Ira Eisenstein was Kaplan's son-in-law. Uh, and, and Cohn was another, uh, a rabbi who frequently worked with Kaplan. It, these are sometimes called the father, the son-in-law, and the holy ghost writer. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, so the text, again, we don't assert that failure to do God's will is punished by some supernatural intervention, by the failure of the rain or, or whatever. Um, but the, this is interesting. Continue the faith that righteousness is recompensed and sin punished. The idea being that righteousness leads to salvation and sin doesn't. And so you can't achieve salvation if you are acting in bad faith. It affirms the faith in the immortality of the soul, but rejects the doctrine of corporeal resurrection. Okay, the place of women. The role of women in traditional Judaism is inferior. Even though people can say that women are held on pedestals, all that stuff, not true. The role of women is inferior. Um, and, and if we wish to uh, keep women attached, interested, committed to Judaism, we need to offer them a Judaism that, is, that offers them equality, that offers them 
the same opportunities for personal self-expression in Judaism as men. First quote here. Then he says, to deny women equality in an environment in which they are recognized as equal in other respects is to invite their indifference to Judaism. I mean, basically he's saying, if, if Judaism is not attractive, is, in, is configured in such a way that it makes women, looks on women as inferior, then women of talent and interest and intellect will turn that talent, interest, and intellect <laughs> elsewhere than to Judaism. He's saying that, that he sees women as more equal in the broader society than they are in Judaism. He has extensive diaries. I have a copy of that first set of diaries, and I look through it because there's an index. And it doesn't, he doesn't talk much, doesn't say much, doesn't make much of the idea of the bat mitzvah or even of the first bat mitzvah. Let's look at some aspects. I wanted to look at anyway, some aspects of ritual practice, in particular at kashrut. What was the function of kashrut? It was that of making the people of Israel aware of its dedication to God as a priestly or holy people. That's the original function of kashrut. What, is, what function has it continued to serve? As a means of Jewish identification and distinctiveness. That, says Kaplan, a means of Jewish identification and distinctiveness is even more important in the North American context where the great danger is assimilation. So the function of kashrut, of a means of Jewish identification and distinctiveness, is important. And it can habituate the Jew in the practice of viewing a commonplace physical need as a source of spiritual value. So kashrut, Kaplan says, has real value. Therefore, it can be retained, but it needs to recognize modern realities. For example, we know that people are going to travel and they're going to be in places where observing kashrut will be difficult. Kaplan doesn't have a solution to that, but he says the community leaders should get together and figure out ways for people to make that adaptation. The last two quotes here, I think, are very interesting because they're, they're prescient. This is in question Jews ask. And and he says, the supervision and provision of kosher products must not be the monopoly of business interests. The avoidance of scandals and the administration of kashrut and of unfair prices of kosher products should be a primary concern of the entire Jewish community. So he didn't know about Iowa beef packers, but he certainly anticipated that that kind of thing could happen. Let's think about Shabbat as one of the sancta. How do we, how does Kaplan look at that? And he says, the Sabbath is central, central to the quest for salvation. The Sabbath expresses for us the faith that man can achieve salvation by cleaving to God, the source of salvation. By observing the Sabbath, we break with the mundane, focus our attention away from survival, and remember the, just simply the joy of being alive, that it makes a pause, makes us pause, and it, and it also expresses our urge to seek salvation collectively. So the Sabbath is very important. And Sabbath, both the pause of the Sabbath, the observance of the Sabbath, and the communal observance of the Sabbath are very important. The Sabbath symbolizes the thought that God is the power that makes for salvation and the three traditional motifs of Sabbath. It's associated with creativity through the completion of creation, the association of Sabbath with holiness, and the idea of covenantship. He's fine with those three traditional values, interpretations of the Sabbath. Kaplan isn't much up for reinterpreting the Sabbath. He thinks it has served a very important function in the past. It serves a very important function now. We can enhance the ideas of what function it serves, and, and, and it's an imp important for us to observe the Sabbath. We are right about the time of Shavuot, and, and I thought it would be interesting to see how the idea of Shavuot and reinterpreting Shavuot has evolved here. Kaplan said, there is no function for the thinking Jew of Shavuot in its current form. Why? Because Shavuot is said to commemorate the giving of the law at Sinai. If there was no revelation at Sinai, then why do we need Shavuot? So 
there is no function. But he said that he, but of course he thinks that the giving of Torah or the receipt of Torah rather than the giving of Torah, the receipt of Torah as the received tradition, as the received culture, as, and as the culture that we make and we build, very important. So he says, the meaning can be retained and adapted to the implication of the doctrine of revelation. The primary function of a civilization is to actualize man's highest spiritual potentialities. Also, he talked about um, that, that the reform practice of confirmation, of, a, of confirmation of older children than bar bat mitzvah age is a good idea. He thought that should be retained. He thought that, that, thought that should be made more general. That, uh, bar bat mitzvah kids are too young to understand the true meaning of confirmation and that a, a confirmation at an older age was a good idea and, and doing it on Shavuot is, as this quote says, entirely in keeping with the meaning of the day. Emmanuel Goldsmith was a student of Kaplan's. He's also uh, the stepfather of Don Rosen. And so we've talked to him and I uh, sent some of this material to him and he said, you should emphasize Shavuot. And he sent me an article that he had written and so here is what his article says. The Jewish people created the Torah, and the Torah, in turn, has created and recreated the Jewish people throughout history. And the Torah has allowed the Jewish people to remain a self-governing, self-educating, self-perpetuating civilization throughout history. So we should celebrate that as Shavuot. In that article, he suggests that Shavuot might be the most important of the festivals. A more current uh, look on Shavuot from a Reconstructionist Rabbi David Teutsch, who's been up here at various times, and was David Teutsch was the editor in chief of Kol Haneshema, of the current Reconstructionist prayer book, and I happened to be in Philadelphia and went to a service, a small, well, 15, 20 people service that David Teutsch led, and he talked about counting the Omer. What he talked about counting the Omer was that the Omer is the period, of course, from, uh, from Pesach to Shavuot, that it is the time from planting your barley to harvesting it. And if your barley crop fails, you could be in big trouble for food supply. So it's a fearsome time. It's a time when you want to be very, watch carefully what the weather is doing, what your barley crop is doing. Uh, and, and so said, uh, Deutsch, we, can, we could think of it, some people think of it also as the time between the freedom of the exodus and the giving of the law. So it's that time when you have freedom but you don't know what to do with it because you don't have the law, you don't have the covenant. So in, in that sense also, it's kind of, the period of the Omer can be seen as kind of a fearsome time. And he says, in a world where our actions have destabilized the environment and endangered the food supply, the Omer should remind us of our dangerous conduct. So Shavuot as a harvest festival has universal value. This last paragraph is a direct quote from, from uh, David Teutsch. As Reconstructionist Jews, we can look on this as a time to be aware of the contribution to our lives, of the values and disciplines taught by the Torah taken in the broad Kaplanian sense. We've seen there's kind of three ways of looking at Shavuot. What does Darche Noam do with Shavuot now? Well, uh, one of our practices is to have a long session of Jewish study. We're, and we do that co-sponsoring with a number of other congregations and organizations in the Tikkun Le'el Shavuot, which is an all-night study session. So we engage with the community in Torah, taken in the broad Kaplanian sense, in an all-night study. So that's very much, I think, what Kaplan would have made of, of Shavuot. Promotes the study of Torah in a broad sense, encompasses a broad community, and brings us together in the pursuit of Jewish learning. This one, I think, is really interesting. Um, my daughter was an educator at this a cornerstone fellowship that trains uh, counselors for Jewish camps. It, 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 it was held at a camp in, in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, a Jewish camp in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. It's a retreat center, a Jewish retreat center. And, and it had over 40 
Jewish camps from all over North America, from Canada and the United States, and from all movements. There were Orthodox camps, camps represented. There were conservative camps. There was the JRF, Camp JRF was there. The Reform camps, B'nai B'rith camps, JCC camps. The very broad representation of all movements. And all of that is accommodated. All the food is kosher. It's called capital camps, by the way. I just remember the name. All the food is kosher. As you walk into the dining hall, there, the dining hall can feed 700, seat 750 people. As you walk into the dining hall, there's a, sort of a wall separating the entry with a lot of passages through it. But on, there are three stations where there are four uh, faucets with pitchers to wash your hands ritually. You can walk in, you can wash your hands before you go and sit down. You daven three times a day. The first, Shachrit is davened at 7.30 in the morning. The camp is geographically kind of spread out. And so at 7.30 in the morning, uh, there's a bus that comes by and picks up the people who want to daven and takes them up the hill, which is a good 15 minute walk up a pretty steep hill. To, to, to where all the campers are, because that's where the davening is going to be. The dance educator, my daughter was the music educator, the dance educator was an Orthodox woman. She wore a headscarf. She wore, and it was hot, she wore long sleeve dresses and long skirts all the time. And she was the dance leader. I found that a bit, uh, whatever, a bit, uh, ironic in some way. But I thought that this whole idea has to be very Kaplanian, bringing together the whole community for a common objective. What's the objective? To increase the Jewish content, to increase the, of the camps, and therefore to increase the Jewish commitment, not only of the campers, but of the staff who were coming there. And they did a terrific job of it. Now, I. I happened to sit at lunch with a woman who really sort of started this program and put it all together. She had no idea that this was Kaplania. She wouldn't have, I mean, she knew about Kaplan, but she really had, was not deliberately doing something that Kaplan would have recommended. They didn't do this because it was Kaplanian. They did it because it works. And that's what I think we need to think about how we apply what we've talked about about Kaplan. It's Kaplanian and it works. Thank you.